being able to lift up worship to him, get on my face and cry out to him and pray to him and talk to him and know that he cares for me and that he loves me completely. That's where the hope happens. You are listening to the Christian Music Archive podcast, part of the new release today podcast network. I'm your host, Dave Maurer. Each week, I share stories about Christ, community, and music, chatting with musical guests who you will find listed on the pages of the Christian Music Archive. There are thousands of creative men and women who have helped shape the soundtrack of the Christian faith, and we get to hear their stories, learn about how Christ has made a difference in their life, and hopefully along the way, we'll learn how we can be a better part of our community. Welcome to episode 104 of the podcast. If you're a math whiz, you'll recognize that 104 is 52 times 2, and there's 52 weeks in a year. That means this episode marks two years since I started this project, and we've had a lot of great conversations with some amazing people. And if you are just discovering the show, I encourage you to check out some past episodes because I've collected over 100 stories about God being at work in our lives and in the lives of the musicians we enjoy. On today's episode, I'm talking with the leader of Sonic Flood. Back in the day, Sonic Flood was one of the first bands to popularize modern worship music, and we get to hear a little bit about how that band got its start. But Rick and I also talk about dealing with a challenging medical crisis that very well could have derailed Sonic Flood's ministry altogether. We'll hear how God provides hope in the middle of tough situations and how that hope is actually used to encourage others. Before we hear today's conversation, I want to take a couple of minutes to tell you about another great program run by Mercy Inc. Bridge to Reading is a program run in 12 Central African countries and the country of Colombia in South America. This program provides hope by teaching illiterate adults how to read and write. Let me share you just some of the reasons why this is so important. First, there is an economic impact for families who can finally read or write business transactions. In many of these countries, women are marginalized after they pass through their childbearing years, so being able to read and write offers dignity in the home. Or my favorite story is of pastors who are teaching the gospel but can't read it, so they have their kids read the Bible to them. Can you imagine the joy a pastor feels when he can finally read God's Word on his own? Learning to read is also a powerful evangelism tool that helps believers learn to read the Bible in their own language. If helping people learn to read resonates with you, I'd encourage you to visit mercyinc.org slash literacy. You can learn about Bridge to Reading there, and you can find out how you can be involved in teaching illiterate adults how to read. That's mercyinc.org slash literacy. And thank you for your willingness to help provide hope for generations. As music fans, we often get caught up in the artist's professional accomplishments. They released so many albums, were a part of these bands, had X number of hits, and so on. While I enjoy talking about that, if you've listened to this podcast for any length of time, you know that some of the best encouragement comes from the offstage life of our musician friends. Well, today I'm talking with Rick Heil. You probably know Rick as the former bassist for Big Tent Revival or the lead singer for the worship band Sonic Flood. But that's just a small part of Rick's story. And today we're going to hear about God's faithfulness at work behind the scenes in the middle of health and hardship. So let's hear what God is doing in the life of our guest, Rick Heil. Welcome, Rick. Hey, Dave. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing good, man. Uh, All the way from Nashville, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, outside Nashville, Murfreesboro, the borough, the borough, yeah, in Middle Tennessee. Well, we were just talking before we pushed record. You and I have uh, one thing in common besides the love of Christian music, but we have German mother-in-laws. <laughs> <laughs> I know we're like brothers. If that if that's the only thing that links us, but still, <laughs> don't worry, we won't be talking in German because Dave doesn't know any. <laughs> Neither does Rick. So it's although, okay. Although you have a pretty good fake accent, I was impressed with that. Yeah, uh, you know, if I'm like on a dare, I'll try and do a fake German accent at a restaurant. You know, 
<laughs> pointing at things. Does this via here? Via yeah. here? No, uh, no, I, I don't know German. Sorry. I could say "Schlafen Sie gut," which means "sleep well," and I can say uh, "Ich liebe dich," which is "I love you." So that's about all. I know. Oh, <laughs> those are beautiful things to know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Have you ever toured in Germany? Yes, um, we played at a military base and a club there. It was tricky because they've got different power set up, and we were oh. like, what in the world? We're going to blow up. <laughs> but it was great. Well, like I said in the introduction, people probably know you from uh, either BTR or Sonic Flood, but I'm always interested in how you got started in music. And I read a little bit mm. of your bio to learn that that was a little bit started out of kind of a healing mechanism from what we're going to talk about later in the show, but uh, as kind of a dis diversion during healing, right? Yeah. Um, when I was 11, I was diagnosed with Crohn's and I'd always grown up um, around music. I grew up in a church that only allowed uh, voices, so non-instrumental Oh, church. Okay. And uh, so you grow up sitting in church and listening to all the different harmony parts. And I started leading singing when I was young. Get that little Ricky up there. And so <laughs> I would wave my hand, you know, as, to the beat of the music and lead singing. And um, then I found my dad's bass in the attic one year when I was in junior high and uh, pulled it out. I uh, loved playing. I loved I'm pretty much uh, a person who likes to stay by myself, um, okay. and I wasn't into sports, and my brother would be, like, outside, you know, kicking the ball, and I would be inside in my room learning songs by Styx or yeah. uh, Kansas or whoever and, you know, playing to the radio or whatever was on Top 40, and, and so I'd you know, you'd be in bands when you're in junior high and then in high school. And uh, it's kind of freaky because I learned how to play guitar in the hospital, which is interesting. I got a 12 string for Christmas one oh. year. Yeah. And the next day I went into the hospital for a long period of time being fed intravenously or um, through a nose tube. Oh. So it was um, just a lot of sitting around and waiting but I had brought my acoustic with me that I would, I'd just gotten, and uh, a hippie girl that was a, a volunteer, she came by, and she's like, hey, you want to learn how to play it? And I was like, yeah, I ain't do anything better. So she <laughs> yeah. taught me some Eagles songs and John Denver and stuff like that on my 12 string. And so it's, you know, kind of unusual, you know, what Satan means for evil, God uses for good. Amen. And you know, that just blossomed into even getting more into music and being in bands. And so I would, I, <laughs> I did, the, you know, and since, since we didn't allow instruments in the worship, I would be playing in bars in Nashville during yeah. the weekends. And then Sunday morning, I would be leading worship somewhere, which okay. is just, it, it seemed very broke, you know, broken as far as like, you know, what in the world are you doing playing for the drunks on the weekend and then uh, leading singing in the, on Sunday mornings? But, it, you know, the church I grew up in, we didn't allow instruments in the right. worship service. But I just loved being, you know, a part of music in any way I could at yeah. that point. So dad had a bass in the attic, obviously you discovered. Uh, so they weren't as opposed to instrumental music as the church was. So you were encouraged at home to be musical? Oh, um, I mean, you could listen to music that had instruments. I mean, I remember one time in sitting in the bus on the way to a retreat and somebody popping in an eight-track eight oh, yeah. cassette tape of <laughs> the new Van Halen at the time. And there it is running with the devil playing in the background while we're in the church bus <laughs> on the way. So it was just so disconnected. It yeah. made no sense. And so they they were they loved music and they were part of music. My dad played in bands when he was younger and that sort of thing. And my mom yeah. grew up singing, just sing, sing, sing. Yeah. And uh so 
not opposed to it, just the two together, that was a big no-no. So So where was it that you discovered this this Christian music industry that was out there, and how did you get tied up with Big Tent Revival? Very interesting. Um, I was going to church in Nashville uh, at a non-instrumental Church of Christ, uh, met a guy there that was in the uh, young people's group or whatever you call it. Yeah. We weren't the college age, but we were just in that older crowd, singles. And uh, he, I asked him to play guitar in one of my bands that was doing cover songs at the bars. And he came up to me one day and said, uh, yeah, we're the a group I was in. It's a Christian group. We're kind of reorganizing it, putting back together and wondering if you'd try out for bass. And yeah. uh, this guy's name was Randy Williams. And, and so I was like, sure, I don't, I'm not doing anything. At the time, I was uh, doing uh, electrical repair work at music stores okay. in Nashville. So everything breaks. So that's a good job for a tech. Um, yeah. And so I tried out for Big Tent and thought, wow, this is what God wants me to do. I'm really excited. I, I really just got into the music and the worship as we started touring and playing these Christian songs. And uh, that's how I got in. Did you write much for BTR? No, I didn't write. Steve right. Wiggins was the primary right. writer. He wrote everything. We just show up and he'd be like, here's some songs. And we're like, okay, great. Let's record them. <laughs> and we cool. did all the recording at Ardent Studios in Memphis, which is haunted. Oh, that's <laughs> no, <laughs> a band house they put us in was like haunted, I guess. But it was some freaky stuff going on. I don't I don't believe in that stuff, but right. Right. But you could get killed. You could get shot because not Memphis is a rough place. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Not a good part of town. So so you left BTR, Big Tent Revival. I keep calling it BTR, but um yeah. and then at some point you got a uh, uh, noticed by or got pulled into Sonic Flood. Now, for listeners who may not remember this, Sonic Flood started as Zilch, which was the road band for DC Talk. Yeah. And they kind of did this project and then the the studio said, Hey, make a worship record. We're gonna call it Sonic Flood. How did you get involved in that side mm-hmm. of of the music um i was coming off the bus with big tent one night and a drummer gave me a pre-release cd of the first sonic flood album okay yeah and they were like hey they're looking for a bass player i don't know if you're into this or whatever but if you are you know pass it on or you know how yeah people are um so i was like oh okay and that night i was driving from nashville to missouri to see my my girlfriend, now my wife, okay. um, Cece. And so I was listening to it and I was just really moved by it. And I felt like, wow, this is, this, this is a little bit different. You know, this is singing to God as opposed to about God. Yeah. And so the, in, the personalness of it was really touching. And as I was driving my truck, I sort of dozed off and, going 50 miles an hour, flipped my truck. And the first thing I saw when I crawled out of this upside down busted vehicle was that pre-release CD sitting in the grass with like glass on and everything. I was like, okay, God's trying to get my attention. So I grabbed the CD and I grabbed some clothes I could get in my guitar and uh, got in touch with the people that put the album together and said, I think the Lord wants me to be a part of it. That's quite a tap on the shoulder. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um so you started out as bass or did you jump right into the lead? Because you've been the lead singer now for 20 years. I jumped in as a bass player. Okay. Um okay. Otto Price played the uh like you said, the yep. the band for DC Talk. And yep. I don't know if they call him Sugar Bear or something like that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Te- Teddy Bear or whatever. <laughs> But he played the bass on that first album, and he didn't want to tour. And uh, so I was like, look, this is, you know, I think something that God wants me to do. Yeah. And so they're like, okay, well, here we go. So that was the lineup then. 
Well, I've kind of equated Sonic Flood, and it was a couple of years blind, but to the American version of Delirious, which mm-hmm. was kind of on the cutting edge of modern rock worship that was not the old hymns or the old Maranatha stuff. Yeah. So what was it that kind of drove you to push this, for all intents and purposes at that time, uh, it was completely a new genre, a new style, of a new focus of music. What was it that kind of drove you to that? I don't know. It, uh, of course, the lyric content is huge, right? Um, yeah. The message is huge, and and the worship is just ultra personal. It's like you're having a conversation with God, or your feelings in song to God, um, as opposed to Him. This, you know, Him. Yeah. It would be you. <laughs> yeah, and. It, the Austin, the instrumentation around it was just rock and roll, yeah, uh, with a little bit of techno ish blended <laughs> in, right? That, um, or electronic music, uh, whatever you want to call it, but seemed to just really, uh, I guess that was the cutting edge part, like mm-hmm. the lyric content was not, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we've yeah. been singing songs to God for a long time, but King David was, yeah. Absolutely. So um, it was more of just the sound, I think, that really resonated with me. And I was was so happy to go from a bus into a van playing these worship songs to people. (laughs) Well, and, and the focus of the music is also evident, I think, by the artwork that you guys have done, because none of your, except for like your best of, None of your albums has the pictures of the band. It's all things that are artistic renderings of how do we worship God in different situations. And so Mm. I've I've appreciated that. And and it's not this, hey, look at us. We're the worship leaders. It's more the focus on what's the music, what's the purpose of the music. Yeah. And I was, (laughs) my daughter is, um, she's a vocal performance major at MTSU and she's coming out with a single and she's doing some stuff. But, um, I was thinking of some album cover ideas that the record company was like saying, Hey, this is a good one. And it was like, one was like a lifesaver, <laughs> like, you know, a life raft, like okay. in the middle of the ocean. I was like, no, that's not working. I don't know what that is about, <laughs> but, but anyway, yeah, it's the focus is not the people. It's really just about the message. And whenever things fell apart in 2000, you start to see that really it it was just about the uh, the worship and not the people. Yeah. So um, anyway, that's well, that's the that's the important part of being uh, in a worship band is that you don't want to take the attention away from the Lord, right? <laughs> and you want to show people how to worship. You know, lifting your hands or getting your yeah. face down or uh, whatever the Lord leads you to do. And so that's been a cool part. Also being able to share my testimony of how God has sustained me through many trials with Crohn's disease, which I mentioned earlier and seeing people really, uh, relate with that. And then, you know, have God heal that broken part in them as we lay hands on people and pray for them at our concerts. So that was, that was truly the highlight. And sometimes I would think, well, this, all this album stuff and this promotion and all that is just a vehicle so that I can be out praying, laying hands on people. Well, that's a a natural segue. I mean, you actually answered two of my questions that I was going to ask in that one thing. So let's migrate naturally to you, you said at 11 years old, you were diagnosed with Crohn's. Yeah. And what is Crohn's, first of all? And then tell us the story of, of how God has touched your life through this Crohn's mm-hmm. diagnosis. Yeah. Um, Crohn's, when I was first diagnosed in 1977, there wasn't a whole lot about it. And actually, I was diagnosed at Vanderbilt Hospital university okay. hospital um and there was apparently just one sentence about it in a book in the library the medical oh. library but now you turn on the tv and it's like every other ad is for crohn's or ul- ulcerative colitis or some kind of you know 
problem with your gut. Yeah. Um, so it's inflammation of the intestines and basically the body is attacking the intestines or something in the intestines. Uh, so you can get ulcers in your intestines and they can get porous and leak in, into your bowel. And so it's, uh, it's kind of nasty yeah, disease yeah, yeah. and uh, it's, it's a very painful illness. Um, so when I was younger, uh, they didn't really know a whole lot about it. So I kind of became a lab rat as it were for Vanderbilt <laughs> yeah. and the uh, interns there. And um, so I had several operations where they took out most of my intestines and so currently I've had about five resections um, mm. and the last time they left me with three feet of intestine, small intestine, and then my colon wow. attached. Yeah. So yeah. Um, not a lot of travel time for the food. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, but the Lord has um, really sustained me through the whole thing. Um, and I can fast forward through those years of touring and go, wow, the Lord has sustained me even when, you know, touring is not the best place to go. If, <laughs> if you've got, um, you know, a very uh, destructive disease like Crohn's disease. And there's been a few times where there's just been issues. Uh, I remember one time I had a hole that the disease had burrowed out through my stomach and oh. so I would wear this pad around my gut to yeah. keep things inside. And I would be on the road singing. And uh, when you sing, you use your diaphragm. Yeah, which pushed so all it was, that. It was hard. It yeah. was rough. But the Lord was always gave me the strength and the ability to worship Him and to lead others in worship and come home alive. <laughs> um when my wife ran for Congress here in the fifth district, middle Tennessee in okay. 2010, um, I decided to take a step back, you know, let her shine. And she lost the primary, but was hired by Jay Seculo for oh, the, yeah. with the American center for law and justice. And so she's okay. senior executive counsel up there, um, fighting for people's freedoms and, uh, getting pastors out of, prison overseas yeah. and all kinds yeah. of cool stuff. But um, it was just the right time because at that time, my health sort of started to decline pretty quickly. And uh, I had a surgery and that's when I found out I had the short bowel syndrome, didn't have a lot of intestines. I started to be fed intravenously, um, constantly. Basically, I would hook up to a, a bag at night and I would that's how I'd eat. Oh, wow. Um, and it got real puffy and it was pretty nasty, but, um, you know, the Lord has introduced me to some people that do a stem cell treatment in Texas. Uh, I think the company's name achieve vitality and it, they were like, look, we're Christians. We love the Lord and we want to serve the kingdom and we want to give you these stem cells. And they've given me about three or four treatments. Ah. And as they started giving me those stem cells, which are, from um, the umbilical cord when the baby's born. Yeah. And so they go through there and stem cells are just like, you know, energized cells ready to go to where you need them. Okay. And uh, it went throughout my body and I, and I don't have a tube going into my chest. I'm not fed intravenously. I'm eating a bagel and cheese right now. <laughs> if you can hear me yeah. and I'm drinking fluids and I drink too much coffee, but <laughs> the Lord is, is the healer, you know, I'm a hundred percent. And, uh, you know, I think the Lord heals in weird way. I, I've always prayed for like an instantaneous <laughs> healing, right. but I'll take the healing anyway. God gives it to me. If it's through some medicine, some, um, ladies, sweet ladies in Texas, giving me stem cells, whatever it is. I mean, um, I think it's all from all knowledge is from God Amen. and yeah. he reveals his knowledge to people. And then we're able to 
use that knowledge to benefit others. And, you know, the um, I get upset with the medical system a bit because it seems like, you know, they want to sell you something or whatever. And But yeah. other times it's like, well, maybe they're just doing the best they can and they're helping me out when – you know, I think I would have probably died if they hadn't have done something. Yeah. So I look at it as a blessing, 100%. And uh, just I continue to ask God for uh, to sustain me and to heal me and to use me up to his glory as long as he gives me breath in my lungs. So when you were first diagnosed as an 11-year-old, they don't know what this really is, except for a line, like you said in the book. And you had a particularly bad case of it. They called it incurable, if I recall. Yeah. What went through your mind as this 11-year-old kid saying, I've got an incurable disease. We don't know anything about it. How did that affect your relationship with God? Yeah. Um, as I got older within, you know, teenage years are always rough. And right. For everybody, I think every teenager goes through some issues and just exploring what their faith means and who God is in their life. And just to, to, you know, you graduate from piggybacking off of your parents' faith to having your own faith and right. figuring things out. Um, you know, I got real depressed and considered killing myself because I thought it would be a good thing. My, my parents are scrapping for money to keep me healthy. Yeah. Um, the treatment is very expensive and I'm just a downer and I'm in pain most of the time. Um, and then the Lord, you know, spoke to me as I'm laying in my bed says, I will always take care of you. And at that moment, on, I'm like, wow, praise the Lord. God's going to take care of me. He's going to sustain me, and he's never let me down. He's always continued to bless me. Uh, abundant blessing, abundant peace, abundant hope in the midst of, you know, trial after trial after trial. You do get worn down, but then you have to just turn to God and lay it down at his feet and know how to surrender that stuff and uh, just realize that it's all out of your control <laughs> except yeah. for where your heart is with God. That's the, don't, that's the only thing you can control is where your heart is with the Lord. And I wrote a song recently called Walk the Streets of Gold, and it's just talking about, hey, after this, you go from life to life. There's no death. You go from walking these streets, hot streets now, about 100 yeah, degrees, right. to uh, walking the streets of gold, you know? And it's uh, just putting your hope in him. And, you know, it, 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 it gets, you get down, you get bummed out, you, you get tired of the pain. And, you know, it's pain does a funny thing to your psyche. It starts yeah. to turn inward yeah. because all you can think about is how do I get away from pain? How can I get away from this physical pain? And that's rough on the people around you that are trying to take care of you, you know, from sure. your parents to your wife, your children as you get older. And um, so it's, oh, it's a pruning process. It's a growing <laughs> process. It's... Yeah. A process. I mean, whoever gets there, not nobody in the flesh, nobody. <laughs> well, you said as you were talking about it that the thing that carried you through was the hope and the peace of God. And to mm -hmm. me, hope and peace are not a tangible, you know, I can hold hope in my hand like I'm holding this pen. So the other people who may be going through something debilitating, whether it's a disease, a broken relationship, financial ruin, whatever. What does tangibly, what did hope and peace look like for you? You're standing on stage having to be this bandaged up. I can mm -hmm. only picture this. God, if people really knew what I was going through, maybe that would turn them off. What, what does hope and peace look like? 
Yeah, that's, I mean, for me, it's in, in, in those times where you're really just wrecked um, physically, it's forcing, I think forcing, I mean, in David, he would say, I'm commanding my body to praise him. I'm commanding my voice to praise him. And as you start to do that, you start to break down the wall because Satan is here to kill, rob, and destroy. That's right. that's his M.O., and he is never stopping. <laughs> yep. And and so he will come in and try and lie and discourage and put up and put I guess blinders or like scales on your eyes so that you can't see past your your present problem. Um, but I think just being able to lift lift up worship to him, get on my face and cry out to him and pray to him and talk to him and know that he cares for me and that he loves me completely. Um it's that's that's where the hope happens <laughs> yeah is that when you have that interchange in the relationship that exchange i suppose and god is communicating to you it's okay he's holding you he's nurturing you as you are falling into his arms and realizing that there's nothing that can help you other than him and then praise the lord i have a god fearing god loving uh, woman who loves the Lord and continually speaks God's promises over me mm. in those times, in those dark times. And um, that is huge. That is priceless. And if you can get, that's why God says, get in a church, <laughs> yeah. get around people. And what COVID has done is just divide and conquer. That's, that's what's happened to the yep. church. It's like, yep. All right, you can go online, but you're going through life. <laughs> you need people around you to to speak God's promises to you while you're going through the junk. Yeah. And it's it's I don't know, the online stuff, it sometimes it may help it, but not for me. I'm, I'm sorry. I need f flesh on flesh. <laughs> yeah. Somebody in next to me going this is from Satan. He is a liar. You are the head, not the tail. You are God's shot, you know, just, you know, pounding down the, yeah. the lies of the enemy with the word of God. I think of the scripture that, he, uh, and I don't remember, I'm terrible with addresses, but his strength is made perfect in our weakness. And I've thought of that over and over again, how if I, in fact, I had a counselor uh, when I was going through divorce from uh, my counselor. It was a bodybuilder. He was mm -hmm. like seventy-five years old. He held held the world's record for bench press in his age group and all that. But anyway, Whoa. when you got hugged by him, you know you got hugged by him. But, <laughs> but he said to me, he says, "You know, the only way that I know muscle is building is when I hurt." Mm. And the fact that yeah. the pain of life is what gives us recognition that God is at work. I don't understand why that has to be, but we have to get out of the way so that God can do his powerful work. Yeah, that's that's a hard one. You you can't say, hey, welcome, welcome to the family of God. Everything's gonna be awesome. I mean, right. it's like that's when you've got a target on your back. Yep. You know, my my daughter and my my daughter especially, she's very touchy feely. Of course, she's a girl, and it's like she's always thinking internally about things and that can get out of control. Um, but it's like, honey, you have to take your anxiety, lay it down at Jesus' feet, and surrender it to him because, you know, this is what Satan wants to do. He wants to continue to tear, tear, tear away at the hope that you have, the confidence you have, the hope and the destiny that you have as God's child on this ball, this planet Earth. Yeah. And... I mean that destiny that that's if if he can cut that off if Satan can cut that off then hey he's got his job done you know but we have to continually keep our eyes on Jesus and be around people who can encourage us when we're at our lowest 
that can build us back up, bring us, pray for us, and speak God's promises over us, and get in the Word and spend time with Him. I mean, we we've got these busy lives, and every morning I'll just turn on the Bible and let it speak to me as I'm eating breakfast. You know. How can we be specifically praying for you and for Sonic Flood and whatever awesome. in the weeks and the months that are coming up in front of us? Um, I wrote a song out of uh, Pentecost Sunday that I spent with a congregation down in Arizona, Crossroads Church in Casa Grande, and it transformed my life. It changed me. They had a time where they put troughs out, they filled them with water, they had people come forward, they baptized 120 people that night. Wow. Um, it was amazing. I was like, yeah. I want to continue that in my worship. And so the Lord gave me a song called The Day of Miracles. And I'm recording it. I'm going to be releasing it soon and going to continue releasing songs that I've been starting. I started since 2013. And I think God just says, it's time. Okay. <laughs> it's time to finish that stuff. And so we're going to be releasing songs and uh, pray that they're a blessing to the church and uh, just to continue and co accomplish what the Lord has started. So that's, that is my prayer. Hey, thanks, Rick. I always enjoy hearing how God is working in folks' lives. In fact, just last week, our Sunday evening prayer service started with people telling their testimonies about how they had experienced the supernatural touch of Father God. Testimonies are so encouraging to me, and I hope Rick's story was also encouraging to you. Recently, I've been studying the purpose of suffering. Why is it that God allows us to go through tough things? If we are adopted by the creator of the universe, why do we have to suffer through things like broken relationships, financial difficulties, or a complex health crisis. Why can't God just take those bad things away? I'm sure there are reasons that we don't understand, and we probably won't completely understand until we sit at Jesus' feet in eternity. But I was reading in 2 Corinthians this week about how God offers comfort to all. In chapter 1, verse 3, Paul writes that God is the source of all comfort. Then he continues in verses 4 and 5 to say, God comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. When they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. For the more we suffer for Christ, the more God will shower us with his comfort through Christ. The testimonies shared at church last week were encouraging to me because I heard how God carried and comforted those who spoke. We saw how God worked in the lives of those who shared their stories, and in turn, maybe we are able to recognize how the Lord is working through our own story. Are you experiencing a tough health crisis right now? Perhaps you needed to hear Rick Hiles' experience with Crohn's disease so that you could see how God is working through your own medical situation. I have frequently referred to Philippians 1.6, which says that God is faithful to finish the work in us that he starts. And maybe, just maybe, our story is part of that good work that God uses to encourage others. I sure hope you found these past two years of podcasts encouraging. I know they've given me purpose during a couple of years of global lockdown. They've also carried me through a job that had lost its luster. And the conversations we've shared have helped me, personally, grow in my walk with Christ. I tell you all this because this episode wraps up season one of the Christian Music Archive podcast. I'll be pushing pause on the recorder for a while as I settle into the new job at my church. You see, we've just hired a new pastor, and there are a lot of changes taking place. And I'm also helping us navigate the business side of church. It's a task that has been neglected and needs some special TLC. So some time away from the podcast will allow me to focus on my new responsibilities and enjoy some summer Saturdays with my wife when I'm not editing podcasts. I'm not necessarily closing the door permanently on the podcast. I'm just taking a break until things settle down a bit at church. That being said, 103 other podcast episodes are still available, so I invite you to scroll through the archives and find a guest that you might not have heard yet. 
and without being too presumptuous, many of these interviews might be worth a second or even a third listen. So head over to christianmusicarchive.com slash podcast and peruse the back catalog. You might just find a nugget that you want to hear again. Until the beginning of our next podcast season, I want to thank you for your encouragement. Thank you for listening each week. And thank you for your amazing comments. But I also want to remind you one thing, and that is that God loves you. In fact, he's crazy about you. It's time for another Mischievous Mowers Miscellaneous Misquotes. I've just written a song about a tortilla. Well, it's actually more of a rap. <laughs>